don't judge a book by its cover. And today's chapter one. And now, uh, how many of you have heard that saying, don't judge a book by its cover? What does that mean? What does that mean to not judge a book by its cover? It's to say, man, to really find out what's in that book, what do you got to do? You got to open it up and start reading. Don't just draw your conclusions based on a cover. Now, we know we shouldn't do that, right? But we do it all the time, right? It's kind of like the story of a man. He's drunk. It's late. He stumbles on a bus. He's walking down the aisle. And here's a lady there with her clenched Bible as a wayward man enters onto the bus. And she says, I've got news for you, mister. You're heading straight to hell. And he says, I'm on the wrong bus again. <laughs> you know what? You don't know. He might be the pastor of this church for all you know, right? We don't know. You can't judge a book by its cover. We draw conclusions about people all the time. We draw conclusions based on what they wear, where they live, what kind of car they drive, how they smell. And, but we all know you can't judge a book by its cover. Why don't you turn to the person next to you and say, you can't judge a book by its cover. So let's talk about this. The first point is this, is you got to look where? You got to look on the inside, not the out. You got to look on the inside. And uh, I recently read a story about a grocery store clerk that wrote to advice columnist Ann Landers. How many of you remember Ann Landers? Okay, writes this, you know, writes to her complaining about people who buy luxury food items with their food stamps. Luxury food items like uh, birthday cakes and shrimp. And uh, she thought, as she wrote, she thought, well, they're being lazy and wasteful. Now, a few weeks later, Landers dedicated her entire column to readers responding back to this, uh, to this clerk. And one of the people, they wrote back and says, no, I didn't buy the cake, but I did buy a big bag of shrimp. So what? <laughs> My husband had been working at a plant for 15 years. It was shut down. I made a shrimp casserole to celebrate our wedding anniversary, and it lasted for three days. Perhaps if that clerk had walked a few miles in my shoes, she would understand. Another woman wrote back and said, well, I did buy a $17 birthday cake with my food stamps. I thought the uh, checkout woman at the store would burn a hole right through me with her eyes. What she didn't know is that birthday cake was for my little girl. It will be her last. She has bone cancer and probably will be gone within six to eight months. Guys, we are so quick to judge. You know, what does the Bible say about doing that? Let's put up this verse. Would you read it with me? Do not judge, or you too will be judged. Now, it's kind of interesting, because in this story I just read to you, who was the person that was being the judge, being judgmental? Who was the clerk? And when you started hearing people's response, who was the one who ended up being judged the clerk she actually fulfilled the scripture right there do not judge or you will be judged now it makes me think of the story in the bible where samuel the prophet he goes to jesse's house to anoint the next king of israel now jesse has several sons and as soon as samuel walks in he's convinced it's going to be the oldest son he looked the part he's tall dark handsome, just like Steve Carlson right there, you know, tall, dark, and handsome. He walks in and says, certainly this must be the next king. But the Lord said, do not, well, let's read it here in 1 Samuel. He says, do not consider his appearance or his height. The Lord does not look at the things man looks at. What does man look at? The outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Would you say that with me? The Lord looks looks at the heart. Now, the Bible says we are to be imitators of Christ. And so if Christ looks at the heart, what should we be looking at? We should be looking at the heart as well. 
Uh, so we understand the Lord does not judge a book by its cover. He takes a look at what's on the inside. And can I just say something that might kind of push back a little bit this morning? When we find ourselves sitting in judgment of other people, what it really reveals is just how broken we are and how blind we are to our own brokenness. It, it reveals that our hearts are out of sync with God's heart. I love this one. is the story of a young lady. Her mother protected her, smothered her, wouldn't let her go outside. Finally, at 17, somebody's saying, you're describing my mother. <laughs> Finally, at 17, she begged her mom, Mom, please, can we move to a bigger place? But it didn't happen. When she turned 18, her favorite uncle passes away. And at that point, she's informed, yes, you're going to be moving to a larger home. Not only a larger home, but you're going to have a crown. She was crowned to be Queen Victoria, the Queen of England. Interesting, because when you first hear the story, you just think the young girl's a peasant girl, you know, this overbearing parent living in abject poverty in this small little place, when in fact, there was royalty on the inside that was just waiting for its right time to be released. Just waiting for the right time to be released. Now, when you look around, we see people in their addiction. We see people in their dysfunction, their imperfection. We draw conclusions. We cast judgment. We marginalize people. But you know what? We need to believe that within every person, regardless of what you see on the outside, is royalty waiting to be released, tapped into, and released. Amen? We need to begin to believe that and look that way. And I can go on to say this. is Some of the most caring, loving people that I have ever encountered in my life have been some of the most broken people. And there would have been a day I would have marginalized them. But, you know, pastoring this church and interacting with people, being in this community has helped me discover some of the most beautiful people, some of the most caring, kind people that I've ever encountered are people that have suffered greatly in their lives. The second thing is this. In not judging a book by its cover, is that you do not want to despise small beginnings. Can you say that with me? Do not despise small beginnings. We kind of see where we're at in relationship to where we want to be. We see what we have in terms of the vision we have. And it can be a little disheartening. Now I want you to see if you can figure out who this person is. At age seven, he wanted to have a pet. He asked his parents about it parents said, nope, no pet for you. So he goes out into the woods. He's going to get his own pet. He finds an owl. He's bringing an owl home, but it put his talons right into him. And as a young boy, seven years old, he reacted through the owl to the ground and he killed it. Felt terrible about that. And so he decided, I'm never going to own a pet. Instead, he began sketching animals. Now, he never made it past the ninth grade. He had a learning disability. He was two grades behind all of his classmates. And although the teacher had to remove him from that class, she encouraged him, don't give up your drawing. Keep doing that. At age 16, he joined the Navy. They allowed him to draw uh, war-related cartoons. His first job just paid him $50 a month. A local dentist saw some of his artwork, paid him $500 to make a short movie on dental hygiene. He decided he would take the $500 and invest it, and instead, he lost it all. And in fact, a few years later, by 1939, he was $4.9 million in debt. He'd gone to NBC, CBS, ABC, pitching his ideas to make these creative movies, this dream that he had, but he was turned down. ABC did allow him to make a comic book. Eventually, in 1955, he opened what everybody thought would be another horrible, dismal failure, but we all know him as who? <laughs> Walt Disney. 
I love that story. Talk about small beginnings. Here he is just making comic books and sketches, but he stewarded his gift. He took care of his talent. He was faithful where he was at. And in time, all of a sudden, the doors began to open to him. Now, Jesus says something about taking care of the small thing. Let's put this verse up here if we can. Josh, look what he says here in Matthew 25. Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with what? Can you say that with me? Faithful with? With a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. See, it's easy to get frustrated with where you are in relationship to where you believe you should be. But, you know, as you read the Bible, I want to encourage you to take note of what God does with a little. Think what he does with a small mustard seed. Think of what he did with the woman who gave just two small coins or the boy that just had two small fish. The Bible goes on and says small is the gate. Narrow is the road that leads to life. And when you look at yourself, you may see only your little faith, your small gifting, your little under, you know, of little understanding. But I want you to understand, don't despise where you're at. If you steward it well and you're faithful for where you are right now, God begins to look at that and he says, well done. You've been faithful with the little. Now I can entrust you with more. Amen? And so you may be in a situation where you're just looking at the little things right now, but you need to understand that's not the end of the story. And then let's take a look at one more point where you can take your setbacks, you can take your bad decisions, you can take your disappointments that may look like a pile of rubble, And because of God's grace, his mercy, and his power that he poured out on us because of the resurrection and Pentecost, you can take the rubble and turn it into stepping stones. Why don't you turn to the person next to you and say, you can take the rubble and turn it into stepping stones. So you guys did really good with the last guy. I've got one more for you. I want to see if you can figure out who this guy is. Are you ready? I'm going to tell you his story. He's a little boy, six years old. His father dies. His mother is forced to go to work and care for the family. So now here here he is, six years old. He's got to take care of his younger siblings. You can tell this was a while ago. Now by age seven, he'd mastered seven dishes. By age 10, he worked on a farm, earning $2 a month. Now, by his 40s, he was cooking for hungry uh, hungry travelers. Uh, But in 1950, the station where he was working, it closed down, went out of business. So he had to live off of his Social Security. He decides he's going to sell his recipe for chicken. So he drives across the United States for two years. He's turned down 1,009 times. At age 65, he opened his first of his chicken franchises. We know him as Colonel Sanders, Kentucky Fried Chicken. Have you been told no 1,009 times for the same thing? For the same thing. You're just trying to sell your chicken. Nope, 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 nope. You know, I would imagine that this guy could have got pretty discouraged. He could have allowed all the setbacks to sideline him and keep that chicken from ever coming. You know, why Christ, why, uh, Christ was on trial um, facing his impending uh, crucifixion. The Bible tells us that Peter denied that he even knew the Lord three times. Now, you know, when he came to his senses and he realized what he had done, he heard that uh, that rooster crow, and he was confronted with the fact that he had just denied that he even knew Christ to a servant girl. The Bible says that he went out and he wept bitterly. 
I have a question for you. When you've been confronted with your sin, has it led you to weep? Has it led you to be broken before the Lord? I think that's a good place to be, but he doesn't intend for you to stay in that place. Now, if you looked at Peter at that point, it looked like he's all washed up. That he'd made this decision, and it was all over for Peter. That he'd blown it. He'd made this decision in his heart. But he was powerfully restored when he went out, and he repented. And he wept bitterly before the Lord. And even though the Lord knew that Peter would fail, look what he had said to him. Let's go ahead and put that verse up there. Do we not have it? Oh, there he is. Okay, Matthew 16. Would you guys read this with me? I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. Did Jesus know Peter would deny him? He absolutely did. And yet the Lord knew there was something in Peter worth fighting for. And God knows all the failures you will have. He knows you're going to fail. He knows you're going to try. You're going to end up going backwards. There may be even times where you even deny the Lord. But I've got news for you. He will never turn his back on you. Amen? God will never turn his back on you. He waits for you, like Peter, to come to this place of repentance and restoration so you can move forward into the destiny that God has has for you. Have you ever felt like you've made so many mistakes, that you've been told so much, that life just has not worked for you, that it almost feels like you are buried underneath a a rubble pile? Okay? I want to encourage you with this. Because of the resurrection power of Jesus Christ, you can crawl out from the rubble heap and you can take the very things that was meant to bury you and to destroy you And that God will begin to use those as stepping stones to move you into the destiny God has for you. I think we need to give the Lord applause for that. Don't judge a book by its cover. You know, I've been pretty judgmental in my life. Have any of you? Anybody? A few of you? I, uh, one group of people that I used to, uh, just kind of in the back of my mind, have a lot of internal judgment toward. Is this okay that I talk about this? Are you guys going to judge me? Maybe. Maybe. I'm just being honest. I think, uh, I think it's good if a pastor can be a little bit transparent. But as a, you know, as a kid who grows up in church, and can I just tell you, sometimes the most judgmental people are the people that grew up in a church. When they should be the ones who best understand the love and the grace and the favor of God, and they're taking that to broken people, instead something gets skewed in their heart, and instead of expressing the heart of God to people, they sit in judgment on them. And really what they end up revealing, maybe not to themselves because they're blind to it, but the Lord sees right through it, and usually so does everybody else, is that this person is completely blind to how messed up they really are. So, that being said, drug addicts. I sat in a lot of judgment against drug addicts. I had my own idea of why they're an addict, why they're not free from their addiction. Well, if they really love God, you know, come on. And you know, pastoring this church, it really, it really messed me up in a good way. And I think we all need to be messed up a little bit. I think some of our religiosity needs to be shaken right out of us so we can get back to the real heart of the gospel. And as I've sat with people 
and they shared with me the pain they were in and they didn't know the Lord and they didn't know where else to turn and they found themselves kind of slipping into this road of addiction and to discover some of, some of the addicts who go to this church I would say are people who love Jesus maybe even more than I do. They love him deeply. They don't like the fact that they struggle. They may get a few days of sobriety, but then they fall back. And I thought, well, gee, if you just love Jesus more. They love him. They're just struggling at a point in their life. And as I've heard their stories and I've wept with them, something changed in my heart. And that hammer of judgment began to fall. And I think for we, for us as Christians, you know, if we were honest with ourselves, we'd say, yeah, there's people I look in judgment against. Somebody asked earlier, they said, well, aren't we supposed to be in the church, in the body of Christ, challenging each other to a higher standard? Yes, that's true. But he also said this. He said, why don't you get the log out of your own eye before you try to get a speck of dust out of somebody else's? What did I say? Yeah. <laughs> Yank the plank. Yank, get, get the plank out of your own eye. And then you can see clearly to help your brother. What I've learned is when it comes to the world, what we've been called to do first is love, period. The authentic love and the authentic demonstration of Jesus Christ in a person's life who is living out the resurrection power is the best evangelistic program I know. Evangelism is not an event you put on a calendar. It's not an, uh, an event you organize, although there will be times to do that. To me, the most effective evangelistic tool in this world is people who have been confronted with their own sin, their own brokenness. They've fallen before the Lord. They've said, God, I need you. And they receive his grace and his mercy, and he changes their life. And now it puts them in a genuine place of compassion to go and begin to help somebody else rather than sit there judging them. Amen? So what did we talk about today, guys? We had a three-point teaching. That's all preachers, that's a good one right there. Three points. So what was the first one? Is that we should be looking at the heart, not the outside. That's what Jesus did. It says man looks at the outside stuff. God looks at the heart. We need to look at the heart. And when we take some time to hear people's story, hear their heart, we'll begin to realize, wait a minute, I drew wrong conclusions. Right? What was the second thing we talked about? Yeah, be faithful with where you're at. Just like Walt Disney. You know, he's being, he's being told no. This isn't working, that's not working. But he was faithful. He loved to draw and he kept drawing and he got better at it. And little doors would be open for him along the way. But be faithful with the little, with small beginnings. Do not despise them. Amen? Don't get discouraged with where you're at. You may have this big dream and this big idea where you should be and you're not there yet. Steward where you're at. Take care of where you're at well right now. And that's when the Lord says, good, you've been faithful with the little, now I can entrust you with more. And then what was the last thing we talked about? We talked about we're going to KFC for lunch. <laughs> Yeah, I got an idea. <laughs> you know, we talked about, yeah, we talked about that. Uh, Colonel Sanders being turned down 109 times. You know, his life was marked by setbacks, setbacks, setbacks. But, you know, through those setbacks, he used them as stepping stones that moved him into his destiny. Same thing with you. You may feel like you're buried under a rubble heap of just bad decision making in your life. But you know what? That does not discard you from the work of God. Because of his resurrection power, he can unbury you. He can raise you up and restore you. 
and the very things the devil meant to bury you and destroy you, God will use as stepping stones to move you into your real call, into your real destiny. Amen? Hallelujah. Let's give the Lord applause for that.